Raquel? Yep, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Global NPO Coalition on FATS webinar uh, featuring a report on the topic, Does the Financial Action Task Force Help or Hinder Financial Inclusion? The report was written by Mike Pisa, a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development. Mike's work focuses on how digitalization is shaping economic development and how policymakers can maximize the benefits and minimize the risks associated with adoption of new technologies. He's also studying how regulations aimed at preventing money laundering and terrorism financing and the growing use of financial sanctions have affected the global financial system and what this means for financial access to lower income countries. Prior to joining the Center for Global Development, Mike spent eight years at the U.S. Department of Treasury working in a variety of roles, including as senior advisor to the Undersecretary for International Affairs. And we're very pleased he's able to join us today. After presenting his report, uh, we will have uh, Danya Stork, Senior Legal Advisor from the European Center for Not-for-Profit Law, to provide uh, some more background on the FATF evaluation process and comment on the findings of the study. That will be followed by a moderated discussion and then question and answer. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the Global Coalition website. If you would like to ask a question, uh, please refer to the Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of your screen uh, and type in your questions and we will read them out during the Q&A session. Also, there is a chat button if you would like to uh, make a comment or leave a chat message during the proceedings. And with that, uh, we will bring up the PowerPoint for uh, Mike Pisa and Mike will join us. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Kay. And thanks for having me here to do this um, short talk. And also thank you for all the work you've done on this issue over the years, um, which I think it's an incredibly important issue. So thank you. Um, so as Kay mentioned, and I, I apologize, my slides aren't very fancy, but here you go. The, the presentation's on a paper I published last month, which is called, Does the FATF Help or Hinder Financial Inclusion? Uh, a study of FATF mutual evaluation reports. And the subtitle is, I read over 30 mutual evaluation reports so you don't have to. Um, as Kay mentioned, you know, my last role at U.S. Treasury in 2016 was um, as a senior advisor, and I was working specifically on the issue of, of de-risking and trying to help the U.S. government create a policy response that made sense. And a lot of my effort was focused on working with the Financial Stability Board to get this body called the Correspondent Banking Coordination Group off the ground. Um, and that's still in existence, and I think is still the lead entity at the G20 level looking at um, this correspondent banking issue and de-risking more broadly. And then since I left Treasury in 2016, I've been working here at the Center for Global Development, um, mostly on a grant focused on this de-risking issue, and the grant is from the Gates Foundation, and this paper is, is a product, is an output for that grant. So uh, next slide, please. So before talking about the paper and its findings, I want to provide a bit of background uh, about FATF and mutual evaluation process. I expect most of you on this call know quite a bit about what FATF is and does. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, but I think it's worth reviewing how the organization has evolved so everyone is on the same page. So when the FATF was established in 1989, it was, it was focused mainly on money laundering risks associated with drug trafficking. And it was composed almost solely of rich OECD countries um, and focused on the policies of those countries. And that began to change in the late 1990s with greater recognition of the globalized nature of the financial system and the view that global AML CFT was only as strong as its weakest link. Um, once those views uh, gained traction, led to a greater focus on developing countries, and these countries were kind of brought into the FATF fold through the creation of, of nine FATF-style regional bodies, and all of those FSRBs were established between 1997 and 2004. So once the FATF uh, expanded its focus to work on lower, work with lower income countries, it, it faced a different set of challenges, right? So the first of these was that lower income countries tend to rely much more heavily on informal financial channels compared to OECD countries. And that made it harder to monitor and prevent illicit financial flows. And second, these countries also tended to have much lower levels of financial supervisory capacity which made it harder for them to adopt the FATF standards as they existed at the time. So toward the end of the last decade, the 2000s, you, you saw two trends. One was this growing awareness that lower income countries were having 
difficulty implementing the FATA standards. And then related to that, there's a growing concern that the way FATA standards are being implemented was making it harder to bring people into the formal financial sector. So in other words, th these policies were exacerbating financial exclusion rather than supporting financial inclusion. And this really led to a, a fundamental rethink on the part of the FATA uh, about the standards, standards uh, which culminated in, in raising the risk-based approach as the essential foundation of AML CFT for countries. Um, and this was done when the FATA revised its recommendations in 2012. And the core idea behind the risk-based approach, and I'll, I'll quote the FATA here, is that it allows countries to quote, adopt a more flexible set of measures to target their resources more effectively and apply preventative measures that are commensurate to the nature of risks in order to focus their efforts in the most effective way. So what we're talking about is moving from a rules-based kind of check the box system to one which assigns resources towards the greatest need. And I think it's worth reminding ourselves that that shift was broadly welcomed and I think is still broadly welcomed by the financial commu inclusion community because it meant that financial institutions could implement simplified measures, often called SDD, simplified due diligence measures, for lower risk customers. And that includes the newly banked and, and vulnerable groups. Because these, were, these groups were seen as presenting a lower money laundering terrorism finance risk because they usually or often conducted a limited number of basic low value transactions. So the catch to all this is that the RBA, the risk-based approach, places much more responsibility on supervisors and financial institutions to assess and understand the risks that they face on their own and then develop a plan for handling those risks. And I think it's fair to say, and the reason we're all still on this call and still talking about this issue is that many governments and many financial institutions are still working through how to do this well. And critics contend that these government supervisors, I should say, and financial institutions have erred on the side of caution by implementing laws and company policies that are more stringent than those required by the FATF. And that's led to a culture of, of overcompliance. So you have this situation where you have FATF officials are going to great lengths to convince people of the flexibility of the risk-based approach, but many institutions are continuing to take a non-risk-based approach. And that was really the motivation of this paper. The goal is to look at in the most data-driven way possible, whether, you know, and move beyond just the rhetoric that's been issued by the FATF, to examine whether the FATF is taking steps that supports financial inclusion um, by supporting national supervisors who want to take a more flexible and risk-based approach. And again, we sought to evaluate this by looking past the rhetoric and focusing on facts as much as we could. And then that led us to focus on the mutual evaluation process. So if we can go to the next slide. So I know Vanya is going to go into a lot more detail about the actual mutual evaluation process, but I do want to highlight just a few things. The first is it's a peer review process, right? And it's a peer review process that assesses each country's level of technical compliance with the rec FATF recommendations and the effectiveness of their AML CFT system. Uh, the FATF itself, uh, the FATF Secretariat assesses um, its original members, which again are mostly high income OECD countries, while FSRB members, which again are, are mostly lower income, low middle income countries, they're assessed by the staff from the FSRBs, often in collaboration with experts from the IMF and the World Bank. The second thing to flag, and Vanya will go into more detail about this, this is a very intensive process, right? Each mutual, mutual evaluation takes about 14 months to complete, and it's carried out according to very strict guidelines in a 172-page document. And I, I should also flag that right now, the, the FATF is in the midst of its fourth round of evaluations, uh, which runs from 2014 to 2024. And this is the first round of evaluations um, that evaluates countries for effectiveness against the revised 2012 recommendations. And to date, within the fourth round, 70 mutual evalu evaluation reports have been issued, and 33 of those have focused on developing countries. Next slide, please. So in this paper, we focus on those, those 33 uh, developing country mutual evaluation reports. And we really, we asked two questions. One, how and to what extent uh, do the assessors take financial inclusion into consideration when they assess the effectiveness of a country's AML CFT regime and what recommendations those findings lead to? And second, how do assessors evaluate countries' SDD measures or the absence of those measures and what this reveals about the, fle the, the flexibility that FATF gives to countries in using SDD? So I'm going to focus mainly on the first question because I think it's most relevant to the NPO community. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. And this is important because before I preview the findings, or I am previewing the findings, before I go to the findings, I want to be clear about the limitations 
of, of both the aims and the approach of this project. So the goal is not at all to judge whether the teams that carry out mutual evaluations were correct or not in their assessment and recommendations. And that's not the goal because essentially that's an impossible task because to do that, we would need the same amount of information that that team had, much of which is pub not publicly available. Also, the, the mutual evaluations are very context specific, right? And they're intended to focus only on high priority, priority risks. So we should only expect assessors to focus on financial inclusion in cases where they view financial exclusion as a high priority. So these are real limitations, but I don't think they prevent us from uh, exploring some very important questions such as why do different assessment teams treat financial inclusion exclusion differently in countries that, that have an apparent similar level of financial access and proceeds generating crime, or why the identification of financial exclusion risk leads to recommendations to improve financial access in some countries, but not others. So in effect, what we're able to do in the paper is report patterns and then speculate about causation. Next slide, please. So after reading more than 30 mutual evaluation reports, what did we learn? Uh, the summary finding of the paper is that the teams that conduct mutual evaluations have generally done so in a way consistent with Batter's rhetoric. That is, they do so in a way that supports the risk-based approach and the flexible use of simplified due diligence measures. But there are some wrinkles to these findings, right? So nearly all the reports include some discussion of financial inclusion and exclusion, but there's a huge amount of variation in the depth of their coverage. I should also note um, six out of the 33 reports had at least one priority action related to expanding financial access or better understanding the risks of the informal sector. But, and the, the big but of the, the paper is that the degree to which assessors paid attention to financial inclusion was strongly correlated with the degree to which they saw financial exclusion as a risk. And there was less consistency around the identification of financial exclusion risk itself. So in most countries where the assessors identified a low level of financial inclusion and a high degree of informality, they raised concerns about financial, exclu financial exclusion, but not all. So examples where they, they found those things but didn't raise concerns would be Cambodia, Honduras, and a few others. And I think this is a really important finding because given the likelihood that assessors will only make recommendations to governments about uh, improving financial access if they have concerns about financial exclusion, if they're not if they're not raising awareness about exclusion, or if they're not keying in on exclusion, then they won't pay any attention to financial inclusion. And that's the, I think that's a problem. So this finding echoes work done earlier in the decade by Tim Lyman, Louis de Coker, and others at CGAP. And it also echoes concerns raised by the Global Partnership for Financial Inclusion, GPFI, who in 2016 said that although standard setting bodies, including the FATF, had taken important steps to support financial inclusion, little progress had been made on understanding financial exclusion risks. And I think three, three years later, that, that remains true. So switching to the recommendations of the paper. Next slide, please. So the re recommendations follow pretty naturally from the findings, right? The first is that the FATA should develop a structured framework for measuring and understanding financial exclusion risks. And, you know, consistent with the GPI's 2016 recommendation, um, the FATA should develop a structured framework that would help assessors and policymakers better understand the drivers and, and risks associated with financial exclusion. Because without this knowledge, it's very hard for national authorities to design policies that preserve financial integrity and support financial inclusion. Along with that, the FATA should strengthen their assessor training and expand staffing to take financial exclusion risks into account more consistently. The core, the core idea here is that the FATF should ensure that its assessors understand the issue well, and they can do this most easily by highlighting the issue in its assessor training in classes. Um, but I think they can also take go a step further, and that's by considering requiring each assessment team to include a financial inclusion expert, because right now these teams are composed of mostly law folks with law enforcement backgrounds. And that might be, the cost of doing this might be prohibitive, and if that's the case, one thing that the, the FATF could consider is develop a small cadre of financial inclusion experts that would be responsible for reviewing each mutual evaluation report for consistency. And then finally, we've recommended that the FATF require its assessors to encourage the use of SDD measures, simplified due diligence measures, unless there is a good reason not to. Given the emphasis that FATF has placed on the importance of these measures, and considering the, the apparent inconsistency in the treatment of financial 
exclusion risks across the mutual valuations, the organization re should require its assessors to examine whether SDD measures would be appropriate in countries where the approach is not established and in cases where there is low risk. So I'm going kind of fast, but I want to I want to close with the treatment of nonprofits, which I think will be of most use to the the audience here. So next slide, please. So here we'll talk about how have nonprofit organizations been uh, treated? How has the MPO sector been treated by the mutual valuations and the teams conducting them? So in the paper itself, this is actually just a small box, but to to do to, to write that box, we had to look at this issue in a, in a much greater amount of detail. So I'm, I'm happy to have the opportunity to report on the findings. The headline finding here is that the nonprofit sector actually received more, much more attention in the reports than any other issue related to financial inclusion. And there's a very good reason for this. So when the FATF revised recommendation eight in 2016, it also required mutual valuation assessors to determine whether a country's uh, AML CFT regulations we're disrupting or discouraging legitimate MPO activities. And this is the only sector for, for which such an explicit requirement exists. So in roughly a third of the reports we, we, we analyzed, the assessor team judged that a country's AML CFD policies towards nonprofits in some way hindered their legitimate activity. So in some of those reports, assessors found that the authorities did not understand the MPO sector's risk profile, uh, and that prevented them from applying a targeted approach. This was the case in Armenia, Botswana, Mauritius, and Zimbabwe. In other reports, the assessors found that the relevant laws and regulations were excessively restrictive or inappropriately applied to all MPOs. This was the case in Albania, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Indonesia, and Uganda. And here, I think I've, I'll just take a second to read um, what the mutual evaluation team wrote on, in the Ethiopian report. It's similar to other countries, but I think they go into a bit more detail. So I think it's worthwhile for for um, participants here to, to know what the assessors are actually writing into the reports. So in Ethiopia's 2015 mutual valuation report, which interestingly happened before the revision of recommendation eight, the assessors reported that, quote, international organizations and counterparts have noted that the laws governing the licensing, registration, and supervision of charities and societies is having the impact of severely restricting NGO activities and thus disrupting and discouraging legitimate charitable activities. They pointed out that while, quote, the licensing and regulation of MPOs is the prerogative of the government, such a broad level of oversight is not required from an AML CFT perspective. The current blanket approach is in any event not justified by assessed terrorism financing risks. And then there were a few other findings that were a bit different than, than most of the reports we found. In Ukraine, the assessors found that the banks were overly conservative in their compliance practices. Uh, that they applied enhanced due diligence indiscriminately or refused to serve nonprofits at all. Um, and I would note that every evaluation team that raised concerns about the treatment of the nonprofit sector also included a recommendation to rectify the situation, except Cambodia. And the other thing I note is that so we, we've ex for each of the reports we looked at, we extracted what the assessment team said about nonprofits. And I didn't put that in the final paper because the paper was already long and quite unreadable. But I would be happy to, to send those to Kay. It's about a three-page document. Um, so if folks are interested, maybe Kay can, can pass that on. And you can see how different mutual evaluation teams are um, considering um, how governments interact with the MPO sector in terms of, of AML CFT risks. So I think I'm going to stop there since I know we're going to have a bit of Q&A, and I'll turn it over to Kay or to Vanya. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, yes. Uh, Please, thank you for offering to share that two-page document. We look forward to seeing it. Uh, and now we have uh, Vanya Spork from European Center for Not-for-Profit Law will uh, quickly review the evaluation process um, and we'll bring up the, the chart uh, that shows the flow, the chart from FATF on the evaluation process. And um, then we'll go to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Kay, and thank you, Mike, uh, for this excellent report and presentation. Uh, in a minute, there will be a chart uh, that shows visually how the mutual evaluation flows uh, during this 14 months uh, that Mike mentioned. Uh, however, I just want to briefly uh, remind you uh, of how this process is uh, broken down in uh, uh, several stages and why is it actually so important why it's so impactful and why we are trying to uh, constantly 
unpack it, understand it, and uh, ultimately uh, have MPOs engage in the process on national level. Um, so as Mike mentioned, uh, FATF and FATF style regional bodies, FSRBs, effectively cover uh, all the countries and territories in the world with this process. And the uh, uh, evaluation results uh, that the country gets uh, can be um, four different scorings for each of the 40 recommendations. They can be compliant, largely compliant, partially compliant, or non-compliant. Now, the level of compliance uh, on recommendations uh, brings on uh, different consequences. If uh, many of the recommendations are non-compliant or uh, partially compliant, uh, there is an increased risk for the country to have its credit ratings lowered, to have uh, restrictions in international banking. Uh, investors are also looking at the, this report and the scoring um, therefore, these evaluations and uh, uh, the process itself are considered to be a very, very effective tool uh, to ensure uh, policy implementation. However, we do see the implementation is inconsistent, at least when it comes to the nonprofit center, sector and financial uh, inclusion. The FATF uses the new methodology, as Mike mentioned. Uh, so effectively, you have two parts of the evaluation process. One uh, focuses on technical compliance, so-called technical compliance, whether the laws, regulations, the entire regulatory framework is in place and in force and effect uh, that uh, is required by all the 40 recommendations. That's the first part. And the second part is whether it works. Does it actually do what it's supposed to do to achieve the set of outcomes, the set of path of goals uh, that are required for each standard? Is it implemented well? And this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where uh, we find inconsistencies uh, in the evaluation reports and especially in the country's implementation, how they understand and how they apply the FATF standards. Uh, you can see uh, in the phases of the process that the process starts with preparations. Uh, evaluators uh, teams are chosen. Um, they usually consist of the neighboring peer country uh, uh, people with financial background from the ministries or criminal background or judicial background. Uh, as Mike mentioned, we haven't seen much of the people with financial inclusion knowledge or civil society knowledge uh, at all. The evaluation team receives preparatory materials, materials from the country and they review all the legal framework, regulatory framework, technical compliance check of laws and regulations. After the desk review, they narrow down their focus uh, and make a scoping note of what they will actually uh, be looking at with more scrutiny, which areas, problematic areas, so-called, uh, of the country are of their focus. Usually, non-profits and recommendation eight are not among those, uh, which can have a negative or positive uh, consequence. Uh, when the evaluation uh, uh, comes in country, this is called the on-site visit. Evaluators visit the country for two weeks. Uh, they meet and discuss with every stakeholder uh, involved in implementing 40 recommendations and with those stakeholders uh, that recommendations are of concern. Uh, so for example, they meet with the private sector, with the banks, with the lawyers, and they should meet also with the non-profit sector. You can scroll up the, 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 uh, the chart. Uh, after the visit, they draft the evaluation report. Uh, this report goes back and forth uh, between the country and the evaluation team. And finally, it is adopted uh, at the plenary session of either FETF or the, or the FETF uh, regional body. It's public. Uh, after the publication, we can finally see uh, what uh, the implementation uh, was all about and uh, what are some of the findings and recommendations that are of concern for our sector. Uh, now, this is not where the process ends, although it's already one year and some uh, in, the, in the evaluation process. After the adoption and publishing of the report, the country is placed either in a regular follow-up or the enhanced follow-up. Enhanced follow-up happens if the certain conditions are met where most of the recommendations or core recommendations are non-compliant and where the country has not implemented the standards particularly well. 
Uh, so enhanced follow-up just means that they are required to report more often on the implementation and improvement of the standard. But the generally, the, the idea of the follow-up, where every country uh, uh, enters into follow-up, the idea is to actually continuously incite implementation and progress in uh, 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 applying the FET of standards. So effectively, evaluation never really stops because the country is constantly, after this long, long, long process of the official evaluation, the country is constantly in the follow-up process, regular or enhanced, and constantly producing new reports to uh, prove that they are actually implementing the standards, how they're implementing, they're improving, they can ask for re-ratings, they can improve their scores, and this is all happening without 99% of the country uh, uh, citizens or uh, inhabitants actually knowing that this process is ongoing. This process affects almost everybody in the country. So I'll stop there, and if you have more questions uh, about the evaluation process itself, uh, please do ask. Okay, thank you, Vanya. Um, people are welcome to submit questions through the Q&A icon. It should be at the bottom of your screen, but I'm going to uh, jumpstart that process with a few questions of my own uh, for both Vanya and Mike. <clears throat> and the first is, I'm, I'm wondering what is known about how much terrorist financing risk does financial exclusion create? And has this been studied or are there examples? So I'll, I'll just take a quick stab, and I think really the, the the key recommendation of my paper is based on the fact that we don't know nearly enough. We, hard, we know hardly at all. I think what we know is, is anecdotal. I mean, there's obviously starting studying the the risks associated with operating with through the informal channel is difficult because by definition the informal channel is difficult to monitor um, and track transactions through. So that's that's a major hurdle. But there hasn't been nearly enough work done in trying to think through, even at just an analytical, theoretical level, um, what what the risks that uh, the informal channels provide and, and what risks are created by pushing activity from the formal financial sector into the informal sector. The one heartening thing I've heard is, I mentioned the work of Tim Lyman and Louis de Coker before, and I had spoken to them after this paper came out, um, and they did say it was, it was well read within you know, the narrow finance, not narrow, the broad financial inclusion community. And there is interest within CGAP and other institutions to kind of take on this financial exclusion risk question again, um, to refocus again on trying to, to kind of come up with estimates of the, the risks associated with informal channels. So I'm, I'm optimistic that more work will be done, but the, the short answer to your question is we really don't know at this point. Diane, anything to add on that? Yes, I, I agree with Mike. Uh, we did with our uh, colleagues from Human Security Collective, uh, we did a report last year uh, and researched uh, Mexico, Ireland uh, about this issue and Brazil about this issue of the risking. Uh, the report is called Understanding the Drivers of the Risking and the Impact on Civil Society Organizations. And we did get a lot of anecdotal uh, information about how the money flows uh, uh, through different channels. Uh, and the biggest irony, I would say, of these stories is that, you know, there are rules that are designed to allow uh, the environment and uh, the framework to follow the money uh, in order to prevent terrorism financing and money laundering. But now these same rules appear to be pushing that money underground and into the unregulated channels. So effectively, the regulators and the standard setters, including the FATF, are now creating additional layer of risk where this money is going underground and exposes both organizations and their staff uh, and people on the ground to a huge risk. Uh, so this is something that uh, has been flagged back to the FATF in the uh, recent year or two. So hopefully they will take notice and uh, take further steps. Well, how, how can FATF evaluators pay more attention to this risk? Uh, what steps? Uh, can FATF take to make that happen? Mike, you mentioned a few in your recommendations. Uh, for both of you, are there, there more things that can be done? So I'll go, I'll, I'll go quick. Go ahead, Vanya. 
just to jump in, I think these recommendations from Mike are excellent. The consistency is key. And this is what we have seen uh, from other areas concerning nonprofit sector, uh, not just for the financial inclusion uh, issue, but for, for other issues like over regulation. Uh, there is no enough consistency on the, of the implementation of the standards and then on evaluating the implementation of the standards. Another thing that, uh, for example, we proposed uh, in the report is to have additional guidance on uh, this particular issue of finance uh, exclusion and finance access for non-profit sector developed additionally by the FATF because the, uh, the banks on the ground keep saying and the, and the countries on the ground keep saying uh, they are just applying the FATF standards. But the FATF keeps saying, no, this is not true. Uh, our standards uh, require you to uh, have a risk-based approach, not to treat uh, the MPOs uh, as, as, a, as a one uh, uh, sector that is not diverse and to you know, de-risk everybody. So we feel that additional guidance would be uh, not just <clears throat> beneficial, but necessary. The only thing I would add to that, and I agree with everything Vanya said, is that this has to come from the top of the organization, right? Just um, not just the FSRBs, it has to come from the FATF. It reminds me of Issue when I when I was working on de-risking within the U.S. Treasury, one of the issues we were, were working on is, you know, a lot of the problems we thought were on this specific issue were were stemming from how um, bank uh, supervi supervis sorry supervisors from the OCC, um, the Office of Comptroller of Currency in the U.S. were going into banks and were not applying the risk-based approach, and it wasn't until and I think some would argue that the, the cultural change hasn't happened in full yet, but we had to work at the top of the OCC and with other uh, federal bank supervisors to make sure that the culture was changing uh, below them throughout the hierarchy of the organization. I think you know we can we shouldn't be focusing too much on the assessment teams. We need to also focus on the messaging that's coming from FATF down to the assessment teams, as, as Vanya was saying, the guidance. And the only other thing I would add, and we've kind of already discussed, is the composition of those teams. Right? Um, they're coming. The, the vast majority of the folks, the people that are working on the assessment teams, have a law enforcement background. And as Fanny said, they don't. They, they're not familiar with the civil society or financial inclusion. So, without including people with those backgrounds, I, I don't see how we get the assessment teams to take this issue on in a more informed way. I do know that the FATF, according to them, has upped their training on these issues. Um, but they're not very transparent about how much that training has increased on these issues. But, um, and I'm, I'm kind of previewing one of the questions I saw pop up on the Q&A from, from Nicholas, have we seen any trends over time towards greater to attention to financial inclusion by the assessors? I think the answer is definitely yes. I'm a little um, constrained in answering that um, because I only looked at one time period. I only looked at the fourth round of mutual evaluations. Um, I couldn't bring myself to look at earlier rounds. Um, but my understanding is looking at the direction of um, guidance from, from FATF officials downward to the FSRBs and to assessment teams, it's very clear that they take the issue of de-risking very seriously. And I think they take the issue of financial ex exclusion seriously. It's not a question of motivation in my, my mind. It's a question of how to do these things well. I think FATF has done pretty well on simplified due diligence measures, right? And if you look at the most recent guidance was 2017, trying it was, a, it was a supplement to the, um, the revised recommendations that basically went country by country, providing examples of where countries were using simplified due diligence measures as an example of how other countries could implement those measures. Now, we haven't seen the same thing in regards to the MPO sector. And I think it's actually much more difficult to do that for the MPO sector, but that is one direction that I think FATF needs to be pushed in. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, Mike, you cited 12 cases where uh, assessors found that legitimate activities of NPOs have been hindered, uh, and ask you both, uh, do you have uh, more examples uh, of ways in which these NPO activities might have been hindered? So the final mutual evaluation reports, you know, by the time I'm looking at these, the, Basically, the MPO sector didn't get more than a paragraph's worth of mention each of the reports that I've been looking at. So there's not that much detail there. And again, I'll, I'll share, I don't want to run through each of the country's findings, but I'll, I'll share them to you and you can broadcast them more widely. So for me, the short answer is no, but 
I'll turn over to Vanya. Well, we see um, the usual. Uh, it's sometimes striking uh, how copycat <laughs> countries can get uh, when they are including these uh, uh, restrictions, and they do. Uh, oftentimes, they do mention it, it because of the FATF requirement, although. When you look closely, uh, you see that it's not risk-based and it's not targeted or proportionate, so it's not in line with the, with the FATF standards. But we do see, for example, increased burdensome reporting requirements on MPOs uh, without any uh, graduation of the size or the uh, money flow, etc. cetera. We, we see um, uh, the requirements to include counterterrorism or anti-money laundering training or prevention policy document in the organization, or even a person, employer, uh, that is a kind of a, a CTAML prevention officer. Um, then we see, for example, lower limits on daily payments to the uh, MPOs uh, via bank transfers. We see foreign funding restrictions uh, that are sometimes also uh, uh, justified by those measures. So a variety of, of different funding and uh, let's call it life cycle or organizational, administrational uh, burdens uh, and restrictions that all uh, come down on uh, MPOs without people in civil society actually knowing why this is happening. And it's not happening only before the evaluation and then noted in the evaluation report. It's oftentimes happening after the evaluation report is being published and when the country enters the follow-up process and they actually need to deliver uh, and uh, they need to kind of improve their rating, they want to uh, score better and then the activity uh, picks up again uh, by the country, by the government and they want to uh, introduce quickly some legislation that will supposedly improve their rating but in effect is just um, overly restricting and it's not producing any uh, concrete effect. Recently, we have started um, really asking the question, you know, is it really, uh, do restrictions on civil society organizations really contribute to combating terrorism and co uh, combating money laundering? And the answer is no. And you have recent research papers on that as well available out. Maybe, Kay, uh, you can send out the link. I can send you the link to the recent paper on that. The answer is clearly no. The restrictions on civil society do not contribute to uh, uh, effectively uh, curbing the uh, terrorism financing. It's just <laughs> contributing to uh, uh, delegitimizing the activities of the NGO, of the MPO sector. And I've seen the question, if I may, from Harun uh, in, the, in the question box. Um, whether the uh, countries uh, still get good ratings, uh, largely compliant rating on the recommendation eight, if they are over restricting uh, regulation on, on civil society, given the new revised recommendation eight that requires targeted and proportionate approach. I would say in the most recent uh, uh, reports that I've seen, um, no, the countries don't uh, necessarily get largely compliant if there are over restrictions or over regulation because the uh, evaluators first assess whether the country has conducted a quality risk assessment of the nonprofit sector and applied the risk based approach, target measures, proportion measures, and so on. But it's not consistent. I have to say, I've seen one or two countries where there has been uh, uh, no uh, quality risk uh, assessment done or risk-based approach and still they got compliant, largely compliant uh, rating. So it's, it's still not the matter of consistency of uh, evaluating the countries. I'd like to uh, bring up a question that has come up in the chat. Um, and this will require maybe some background uh, that I'm not familiar with, but it asks what integration does this process have against both the IMS, International Monetary Fund, and IBRO audits? I'm not sure what the IBRO audits are, uh, but those assessments uh, for the countries that are subject to those, and what is the uh, integration or interplay between the FATF assessments and those? Is that uh, something you're familiar with and can address, Mike? 
So let me reread the question real quickly. <clears throat> the IMF uh, audits, I, I'm, I'm guessing that means the, the Article 4 assessments. <clears throat> I think they're, my understanding, they're complete. I don't know of a connection between Article 4s and uh, the FATF mutual valuation reports. I mean, there might be some cross referencing between the documents, but the, the, it doesn't it doesn't flow into, and there might be exceptions to this, but to my knowledge, <clears throat> FATF mutual valuation report findings do not flow into kind of find, uh, Article 4s or kind of um, IMF focus on macro financial stability. And I'm sure, you know, the latter part of the question, do they kind of feed into kind of things like U.S. Treasury foreign country intelligence assessments? I'm sure they do, right? I'm sure they're seen as an input to those, to any um, intelligence assessments, but I, I couldn't go further than that. Okay, thanks. Um, I, another question, it, it, one thing from the report, when you, Mike, you talked about simplified due diligence and enhanced due diligence, and FATF says countries have flexibility in applying this, and but it, it often is not applied, and that certainly rings true from what we hear from our members uh, and of the coalition and their experience with banks. Um, but uh, if the countries are not hearing FATF's message about simplified due diligence and that flexibility, what are some things that could be done to re reverse this trend of overcompliance? So just two quick points. First, I mean, yes, the FATF um, does uh, promote flexibility in the use of simplified due, simplified due diligence measures, but that is based on a, a understanding of the risks that the country faces, right? So that means that countries, governments have a responsibility of understanding the risks they face, assessing those risks, understanding, and then developing a plan to address them. So what you see in a lot of the mutual valuation reports, anytime, in most cases, uh, the evaluators said that the countries were implementing SDD measures um, in line with their national risk assessments. Because the national risk assessment is the, is basically the country's, um, the country's way to fulfill the task of assessing and understanding the risks it faces is often done in collaboration with staff from the World Bank and maybe the IMF. Um, but they use those national risk assessments to, to then say, okay, these are the sectors where risks are high and we can, we should be um, applying maybe perhaps enhanced due diligence. And these are the sectors or the groups of consumers and users where risks are lower and then we can use simplified measures, right? So just to be clear that, I mean, it isn't a carte blanche where the FATF says just go and use simplified due diligence measures, the governments and the financial institutions have to do their homework and understand their risks first before they do that. And then the second part of the question is how do, how do we make sure that governments are taking um, advantage of that inherent flexibility in the risk-based approach? And to me, and I think to the FATF based on the actions that they've taken, this is really just about information flow, right? It's about countries knowing what uh, tools they have to avail themselves of and knowing what flexibility actually they are encouraged to make use of. And I think the FATF, again, is doing this on SDD measures with financial institutions. I think it is much harder with the MPO sector, just because there's such a variation across the sectors itself, even within a country, but even more across countries. So I think the hurdle is much higher, but I think it, it comes down to information flow. One of the things that fell out of this paper, but I've been thinking right at my blog about, is this idea of kind of creating information hubs at the FSRB level where because there is such variation in um, how mutual valuations are conducted, maybe that's what we're saying. It's not, not necessarily variation in how they're conducted, but the composition of the teams and the ultimate findings. And there's also variation in the technical assistance that countries are getting. They would have a hub whereby, you know, uh, supervisors could learn from one another uh, what was working in countries and not working in other countries. But to me, it's all about information, and that's why it's taking so long to kind of correct course uh, on some of these issues. And it's taking longer for the MPOs, one, because of the complexity of the sector, and two, because the FATF recommendation eight was so off in the beginning. Exactly. I just want to pick up on Mike's uh, last point. Uh, the, in the research that we've done with the uh, HSC, uh, the bank's perception of the sector as being labeled for so long as particularly vulnerable to terrorist uh, financing abuse has stick. Uh, and uh, this is uh, still in, in the minds of the uh, banking sector, this is still the, uh, one of the major reasons um, 
uh, why they uh, find it, uh, why, why they deem the sector as high risk. Another uh, issue that we also um, uh, found was uh, the cost versus uncertainty. So the, the, the variable of cost of compliance with uh, all the AML and CFT requirements, which practically means that the, the banks should uh, profile its entire customer base and uh, each to approach each uh, uh, MPO client as individual uh, versus the relatively small profit that they gain uh, from the non-profits, right? So the banks have no incentive uh, to uh, increase their costs of compliance for the clients that actually bear very little profits to them. Uh, and it's easier due to uncertainty, uh, due to high fines, uh, potential reputational damage, and so on. It's easier for them to classify the entire sector uh, or majority of the sector as high risk and then uh, proceed with that. Well, as we, as we move into the, the last minutes of our, of our webinar here, um, I want to ask uh, one important question that has come up. What opportunities are there for civil society organizations to use the FATIS process to press for improvements on financial exclusion at the national level? Vanya, do you want to take that one? Sure, what we've done uh, with uh, colleagues and partners uh, from the Global Coalition recently uh, is we basically kick-started uh, uh, a couple of national level uh, multi-stakeholder dialogues. Um, we try to bring people uh, to the table to discuss the issue uh, and to try to understand uh, where, uh, uh, this, um, where the problem lies why uh, the banks are uh, stopping or, or uh, uh, you know, making it difficult uh, to access financial services, and what can uh, both partners in this uh, conversation do uh, to make it better? Because it can not be left only to the banks and to the MPOs as a client uh, uh, and uh, provider relationship. We need to include more uh, uh, people in the dialogue. We need to include the government, we need to include the regulators, we need to include the FATF, the standard setters. So this has been, this has been tried in a couple of countries. Slow, slow improvements uh, have been made, uh, but this is not the overall uh, solution for the entire system, right? This can only work in uh, uh, some countries where such dialogue is possible. What I've seen recently uh, that has been done with Syria, uh, there is an ongoing effort uh, for a multi-stakeholder technical compliance dialogue uh, rela uh, rela um, relating to the humanitarian payments. Uh, they intend to uh, pro produce basically the risk management principles guide for sending humanitarian funds into Syria and within Syria. So this is another interesting example that has started. Um, we will see how, uh, how the results from, from that will uh, be. Uh, again, this is a very specific issue where you have uh, the need to open up the flow for humanitarian aid and uh, financial access for humanitarian help. But any kind of uh, additional guidance that includes uh, multiple stakeholders that includes the regulators, includes the banks, the civil society sector, and the FATF, uh, I think it's very, very beneficial. Another uh, thing is uh, that we see different initiatives trying to help uh, with technical issues uh, of um, certifications, of uh, uh, compiling additional information, about nonprofit organizations that can help banks understand how MPOs work, uh, how they send the money, uh, why it is sometimes seen uh, very confusing from the uh, uh, commercial point of view. Uh, what we've also heard from the, uh, from the research we've done is that uh, when the banks use the software to flag uh, specific um, suspicious transactions, this software is basically formed on the idea of commercial transactions. And when it um, encounters uh, many different uh, uh, MPO, nonprofit transactions, which are 
uh, varied and they, they are not always in line with what is intended for the commercial business sector, uh, the software itself flags up the suspicious transaction for the bank. And this becomes uh, problematic for the bank because you know, they have one software that's kind of a, uh, supposed to fit all, but they have different client profiles that, uh, you know, non-profit sector is completely different and with completely uh, different set of activities and transactions than the profit sector. So this is another area where banks are trying, uh, non-profit sector is trying to educate the banks on how they operate, how they uh, transfer money, how the transfers need to be done in order to uh, facilitate understanding. But without, uh, as Mike and I mentioned in the beginning, without the uh, coming from the top, without the FATF and the, the policymakers and the standard setters uh, issuing additional clear guidance, I don't think we will get very, very far uh, with national level dialogues. So I actually have a quick follow up question for Vanya because when I was reading through the, um, the mutual evaluations on how the assessment team, many of the assessment teams said they met with civil society and then they were taking on board their input. Is, is there a kind of a structured process which civil society members can engage with the FATF or is it more, much more ad hoc? No, unfortunately, we have been trying for years to set up uh, the uh, clear engagement path, uh, both with the FATF itself, uh, which has a, a, a private sector consultative forum as a venue and a, a forum for the dialogue. But other than that, it's very difficult to engage with the FETF and FSRBs themselves, uh, but also on national level. The, there is nothing uh, in the FATF guidance or, or even the, uh, the standards themselves that uh, requires uh, engagement uh, with different stakeholders including the non-profit sector. So basically it is uh, left for the non-profit sector to organize themselves and require engagement themselves, both with the uh, national government and if possible with uh, FSRB representatives who then translate their uh, request uh, to the assessor teams because nobody knows who is on the assessment team. So you cannot even contact the team itself. This is something that is on the global NPO coalition on FATF's agenda, uh, and we will continue to push for that kind of formal process. Um, I'd like to, like, she's going to check and see any last questions. Those who we don't have time for, we will um, uh, ask the commentators here to uh, answer, and we'll send that out to all the participants. Uh, along with a copy of the PowerPoint and a link to this uh, recorded version of this webinar that will be on the Global NPO Coalition website. Um, and uh, that information uh, we hope you will share with your colleagues. But before we con uh, conclude, I'd like to ask uh, Mike and then Vanya to share any last thoughts you, you have. And thank you for your presentation today. Yeah, thanks again, Kate. Um, maybe because this is where my mind is, because I work, usually work on digital financial inclusion. I, I noticed one of the anonymous attendees asked the second to last question Is there any effort to establish a special consortium of financial institutions, a new unique universe of finance of institutions result that kind of focused on supporting humanitarian assistance outside state sponsored financial institutions? And that made me think that I, I do know of a lot of the large nonprofits that are working on projects. Um, to try to get over these hurdles associated with getting uh, access to financial services. And a lot of them are tied to um, doing payments digitally and, and somehow kind of trying to raise the visibility and the monitorability, traceability of the payments that they make. And I think, I think those projects are still nascent for the most part. And, and of course there's other efforts too. And, and I, I'm not point I'm not pointing to Facebook Libra as a solution for these issues, but, there's, and I think there's an interesting overlay of the uh, discussions around digital versus cash payments that, that overlays with the discussion we're having about um, traceability and the confidence of banks and other actors to know exactly where funds are flowing um, into and out of MPOs that will be, that ultimately could be the most important fix for some of these problems, right? Um, convincing, MPOs convincing, um, trying to convince financial supervisors of their credibility is, is, is a long game, but providing them mechanisms in which they can easily 
um, check to see where those funds are flowing is, is perhaps an easier easier step. I'd actually like Bonnie's opinion on that, but maybe that's just because where my head is because I'm actually usually most focused on digital financial inclusion efforts. But I, I, I do think that's an avenue of potential, um, a fruitful avenue. I can maybe address uh, one question that came in, uh, uh, which is partly connected also to what Mike is saying. Uh, what opportunities are there for CSOs to use the FATF process to press for improvements on financial inclusion at the national level? Uh, although the opportunity to engage directly are scarce, uh, I think the best uh, uh, way to go about it is to actually uh, uh, use the argument that we mentioned at the beginning that financial exclusion actually actually creates more risk of terrorist financing and money laundering because the money is not flowing through the regulated channels. So uh, uh, this is the way uh, to communicate that process and that problem to the evaluators. So if there is a, a evaluation upcome in the country, I would say uh, try to find out when the, uh, the, uh, uh, the visit of the evaluators will happen. This is all uh, written in the FATF website uh, in their calendar of assessment. Uh, and try to uh, figure out which uh, FATF regional style body uh, your country belongs to or the FATF itself. So you can check the members uh, on FATF page. Uh, also check the members of the nine FATF regional style bodies to see where your country is. And then try to contact the secretariat of either FATF or FSRB, or regional body and uh, submit your concern as uh, uh, an NGO or as a coalition, even preferably as a, as a more, more uh, uh, concerned uh, stakeholders. Um, everything that you send uh, to the FSRB uh, secretariat or FATF secretariat ahead of the evaluation will be shared with the country government. Beware of that. So this is one way you can try to use this process uh, to flag this issue for the assessors if they have time then to deal with this issue. As Harun mentioned somewhere below, it is incredible to uh, deal with 40 different recommendations in two weeks time uh, interviewing all the stakeholders. I agree. Uh, usually the, uh, our recommendation for nonprofits is not so much high on the agenda, but we pay the high price uh, for its implementation. Thank you, Fania. Thank you, Mike. Um, it looks like from the direction of this conversation that the Global Coalition uh, membership can have some further discussion on how we can influence the evaluation process to get our input in. Um, even though there's no formal process, there are entry points that uh, people have taken advantage of in, in different situations. Um, and also to talk among ourselves about how we can effectively lobby um, our governments and the FATF itself to establish uh, clearer guidance and procedures for participation, but also to address these restrictions and the issue of uh, financial inclusion more generally. So this report is a very helpful uh, platform to take that discussion forward. And so again, thank you, Mike, for reading all those evaluations so we didn't have to, <laughs> and for yes. uh, providing us with this information. We will uh, be sending out the, the links uh, and copies of the slides and link to the webinar and other materials uh, as a follow-up to uh, people registered for this event. And it will also be on uh, www.fatfplatform.org. So uh, thank you all very much. Thanks, Kay. Thanks for organizing.